Hello, and uh, welcome to uh, Living in the Word. I, um, I know I've been out for a little while. I Last I spoke, I said I was going to be out because um, I'm writing a book, and uh, that's coming along very well. I'm about halfway, um, about 150 pages in. Um, I'm, I'm estimating around 300 pages-ish. Um, so that's that's coming along and it's I can't do both at the same time um, I just don't have that much time um, so it's hindering what I've been doing on here but I am going to keep going so but I do, did want to jump on and do a spontaneous message I actually did not plan for this one um, I have no notes. I have no sermon notes. I didn't study any scripture ahead of time. It's just some some stuff that's been on my heart. I've been listening to um, other sermons and and speakers, and I think they've they've given a great perspective that unfortunately a lot of people probably won't get to hear, um, because unfortunately, especially in the Christian circles, we get in our little circle, our little bubble. We get our favorite teacher and we won't listen to anyone else and if we hear something that contradicts our favorite teacher we we just won't receive it because our favorite teacher didn't say that so therefore it's not true which is really a, a, a lie from the pit of hell but what i wanted to talk to you about is what are you passionate about you know and it, you know, with the Supreme Court decision about Roe v. versus Wade, which was just a miracle and move of God, um, working through the prayers of His people, you can see the 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 so-called pro-choice um, movement or side of things, whichever one you want to call it. They are really passionate about it. I mean, it's they're demonic and from the pit of hell. But they are really passionate about it. And you just can't help but wonder, why isn't the church that passionate? Now, I'm not saying the church should be out there doing the things that they do. But that passion can be focused into Christ-centered activities, you know, on an equal level. Or even should be a greater level if, if Christ is for us, who could be against us? But really, you know, the, the church... In large part didn't care you know you, you listen to there's several videos out there about major leaders about this they were they're just asking where, where's the church at you know even just people that their hatred for Trump was so bad they could not even acknowledge that he put the Supreme Court justices in there used by God appointed by God to get those justices in there who would who would do this to be a vessel of God on the Supreme Court that their just hatred was so much they couldn't even bring themselves to say this was a good thing because then it would acknowledge Trump did a good thing which these fools are just so blind by hatred they Trump did many good things this was just one of them but there's just no passion for it. The churches should have been cel that the following Sunday in every church in America should have been a celebration service. Just whatever plans you had, cancel them. We're gonna just honor God and thank God for what He did in our nation. When when demonic authorities and this is the part I love, it wasn't under a Republican president. It was under a demonic, evil administration right under their nose God pulled the plug on abort on uh, federalized abortion in America and it opened the way for states to start doing their thing and um, they're and they're you know, and many of them are and you know I know people they've spent their whole life fighting this and a lot of them some of them went bankrupt because they were just so impassionate about it, they, they left their job. They, they didn't even have a paying job to go after this. And so, you know, and as the work goes to the states, and there's other issues too, but I'm just, I'm just 
curious. What, what are we passionate about? What are you, ask ourselves, what are you passionate about? So I pulled up um, real quick links on scripture that talks about passion. Where, where should our passion be? And my, and I know there's a lot of great churches out there, passionate, love the Lord, pursuing him with all their heart. And you might be watching this saying, well, well, my church is passionate. What are you talking about? And I, you know, my, mine is too. So I'm not talking about everybody. But if you expand your horizons and look and listen to what other churches are saying and doing, you're not going to find a lot. People, pastors are so afraid of culture. They fear God more than they, I mean, I'm sorry, they fear man more than they fear God. And they want to be relevant, they want to belong, they want to be accepted by culture. So they just go along with whatever culture is doing and, and avoid anything that might offend really just demonic, evil inspired thought agendas. And I mean, it's a great day when you wake up and go to bed knowing you offended a bunch of demons today. That's the whole purpose, that's the whole point of being a Christian. You know, uh, the Bible says it, if, you, if, you're love, if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. You know, God called us to be separate from the world, not be a part of it. We're in it, but we're not of it. There should be some kind of separation. And, and if you find yourself constantly on the world's side, fighting against the church... I think it's pretty safe to say you are on the wrong side. You are an enemy of God. And it's really time to do some soul searching and repentance. So I want to read some scripture on passion. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 23. It says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And I, and I remember reading about this or hearing, listening to a sermon about this. Um, you know, the pastor made an excellent point is Christians in the workplace, in the secular workplace, you should be the hardest working employee they got. You know, and it, it doesn't even matter what, what, what company it is, what you're doing. You should be the most faithful, most loyal, most, um, unless it comes against, you know, the word of God, the most obedient employee they got. I mean, really, Christians should be employee of the month every month. Because you should be going all out, not for that. Even if you work for the most godless, cruel, mean person alive, you should be going all out, not because of them, not for their sake, not for that company's sake or for their bottom line's sake, but for the Lord's sake and his name's sake. People should look at you and say, well, I don't really agree with anything they say, but you know what? They're authentic. You, you get that when you... Um, you know, you're, you're doing everything you got as for the Lord, not for man. So, and then here's Galatians 5, 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So, again, we're, when you're speaking about passion, are you pursuing passions of the flesh or are you pursuing passion for Christ? And again, if you just compare your how you, how do you judge that? Compare yourself to the godless people in your life. Are you watching the same TV shows that they watch? Are you going to the same movies that they go to? You know, you, are you doing all night drinking binges like they are? And then you, well, I wake up and I go to church. Well, that doesn't mean anything. You're no different than they are. You know, are are, are you pursuing? Wealth, money, power, position, title. You hold grudges, unforgiveness, bitterness. You know, and are, you, are you generous or do you hoard all everything you got? You know, how this isn't just this isn't like to say you should compare your you know faith to other believers, but I'm just saying take an overall general look at your life. Do you stand apart? Obviously you're not gonna be perfect. Nobody's perfect. You know, and I'm not saying like, well, the world goes to football games, so I guess I can't go to football games. No, that's not what I said. But whereas the world is obsessed with their football games, you know, people sell their souls for their team. 
Is that what you're doing? Are you are you gambling and betting all you have, your family's future, on, on your team? Or do you just watch the game, enjoy the game, and move on? You know, crude example, but that, that's what I'm talking about, the kind of things I'm talking about. And here's 1 Corinthians 10.31 again. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Again, wherever God puts you, and I, and I can't tell you where God puts you, only that's between you and God. But wherever God puts you, are you just giving it your all? Not for that, that the sake of anything else but the name of God. Are you doing it for the glory of God? Where people can look at you and say, you know, he's pretty outspoken. She's pretty outspoken about this Jesus thing. And I don't like it, and I don't agree with it, but you know what? I got nothing against them. There's nothing I can say against them. They're the most honest, most hardest worker. They have the most integrity. I mean, you try to make an accusation against them, they're untouchable. Is that you? Or are you just like everybody else, a, a slacker that the employee would rather be without? I mean, even if you don't witness, your work habits are a witness. So Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And, I mean, you should be seeing a theme here that, you know, what is your treasure? What are you pursuing? Are you pursuing the things of God and the kingdom of God, or are you building your own kingdom right here on earth? Is your own treasure right here on earth? Is it... You know your 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 house. You just pouring everything you got into building this, you know, sometimes literal castle for yourself. And or are you you're investing in the kingdom of God. Are you building a portfolio and wealth? And there's nothing wrong with that. But is it consuming your life, or is the things of God consuming your life? And I like I like I really like this one. Psalm eighty four two. And, and this one really, really hits home for the believer, as, as it should. This should be all of us. It says, My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. You know, that, you know, we might identify the courts of the Lord just simply going to church. Are you passionate about your church? If your church was in financial trouble for whatever reason doesn't even matter pastor puts out a word the church is in financial trouble oh well i'll just go somewhere else or no wait a minute i'm invested here this is my church this is my local church these these are the the people that god put me with what can i do to help you know if your church is going through trouble do you do you stick by them or just oh, i'll go somewhere else you know, the, the pastor speaks truth and offends you. Oh, I'm offended. I'm going somewhere where they're going to teach me what I want to hear. You know, the, that, that's the wrong answer for a believer. And, and I understand there's going to be disagreements, you know, minor disagreements and whatnot. You, you can disagree with your pastor without being insulting to him. You can disagree with your pastor without being disrespectful to him. You can disagree with your pastor without leaving the church. You know, in, in all honesty, there's a couple of things I don't agree entirely with my pastor about. But I still give him respect and honor. I still go to church. I still love my church. I still feel like, you know, we're growing up with them. And so are, are you passionate about your church? Or is it just something that can come and go and it doesn't matter you know it's like people's people's faith and loyalty have really been tested these last few years it was your loyalty to your church or was your loyalty to man you know i'm so thankful and praising to god that, that i went to a church that did not close during the pandemic they closed for a couple of weeks until you know, they had a, a chance to pray about things, a chance to consider some things, a chance to really see and investigate what was going on. And then ultimately they made the decision, you know what, we're opening our doors. People come, we're not turning them away. 
So, and, and I was right there the whole time. And, and there's, there's nothing that's, that's ever going to change that. You know, and, and people tried to cite, oh, well, you got to obey the government. No, you obey God. And I, I meant to look it up and I forgot. I heard this quote. Uh, maybe there's some historians on here who tell me and remind me who said this. One of the founders of this nation said, disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. And he was, of course, speaking about England. You know, people probably tried to use the same same excuse to, to tolerate wickedness in that time. Well, England's in charge of us, so, you know, we got to obey England. The Bible says so, and it's not what the Bible said. That's not the intent or heart of what the Bible says at all. And your duty as a believer is your loyalty to it as a believer is to God highest above any government so when a government tells you you cannot go to church you cannot worship God you cannot believe in the things of God then you can politely tell that government what to go do with itself you know because it's, it's not going to happen when when um Nebuchadnezzar built the golden uh, statue, the, the government authority, commanded everybody to bow down to it. And uh, only three out of the crowd of however many thousands stood up and said, no, we're not bowing down. You need to be that person. It's like, no, we're, we are not. The government, especially this evil and corrupt administration we have right now, whatever golden idol they put out there, you need to say, no, I'm not bowing down to it. I refuse. I belong to the Lord and his kingdom and his authority is higher than your authority. That's what this nation was founded on, the belief that there was a higher authority that government was responsible to. They all couldn't agree on who that higher authority was, but they could at least agree that government was not the ultimate authority, that government itself was accountable to a higher authority. And the, uh, the rights of the American citizens did not come from the king. They did not come from government. They came from God. And therefore, they could not be touched. So, let me throw a couple more verses in here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Um, again, drawing attention to... Your, your passion is the lust of the world, just like the godless people. You know, the, the, whole, di the whole idea of um, the sexual immorality is suddenly taboo in the church. Oh, no, we can't speak about that. We can't talk about that. People will get offended. We can't talk about that. And you, you're not loving anyone by just watching them nosedive off a cliff. That, that's the most vile hatred that, that anybody could ever do. And yet they want to disguise it as, well, we're loving them. Because they, that's all they can do. They, they know the Bible doesn't say that. So they have to come up with this excuse of like, oh, well, we don't judge and, and we're loving. We're just going to love them. And then they take a nosedive over the cliff and, oh, we're just going to love the next person. And it just continues. And really... If you truly and if you love somebody with a Christ-centered love, you tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Uh, as Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. See, all these things are that he lists here belong to this, the, the evil and corrupt world. They do not belong to people who love Jesus. Sexual immorality impurity, passion, and evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. Basically, you want what everybody else has. You know, you know, it's like I always, you, you kind of have to laugh sometimes. Um, you know, the so-called poor people, and yes, there are poor people, but a lot of them really aren't. They may not be rich, but they're not poor. 
always talking about, oh, the evil, greedy people, the evil, rich people. Oh, they're so greedy and they, they're rich and they're evil. And like, you know, uh, envy is no less of a sin than greed. So whatever sin you're accusing them of, you're neck deep in just as bad. You know, and, and are there greedy, evil people? Absolutely. And, it, and it's kind of funny because these very same people, if they got, if they were somehow put into that, that same position where they maybe opened a business and it took off or they wrote a bestseller and it took off and now they're a millionaire, they, they would not be doing the things that they want those other rich people to do. They would hoard it all themselves just the same. Because really, they're not mad that these people are rich. They're mad because they are not rich. They're not mad because they're the rich people aren't sharing. They're mad because they're not rich. And they believe that the rich people should give to them. Now, for the, the Christ-centered biblical answer to that is a generous heart, which the Bible does command. Where the individual believer, because he has joy and gratitude and love of God in his heart cheerfully gives which is what the Bible says it's like all these self-righteous people that say oh you're not a Christian if you don't want the government to come tax rich people to give to the poor while they themselves are doing absolutely nothing you know you just you don't know whether to cry or, or to laugh for these people and it's sad really but all you can do is speak the truth to them and hope they receive it. All right, I'll go through one more. There's a bunch here, so let me... Um, you know, Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You know, again, there's this anti-church movement to like, I don't know, I can't even begin to try to understand it. There's people just hate the institution of church, the church building, having a building, you know, believers gathering up together. And, and really, it's, you don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere does it say, just stay at home and do your own thing. It, it says that nowhere. I mean, believers who love the Lord God and who are passionate about Jesus and the kingdom of God, they can't wait to go to church. Church doors open. They're like, I'm coming. You know, sometimes life gets in the way, but they're upset about life getting in the way. They're not cheerful like, oh, phew, I have to work this Sunday. Thank God. You know, that's the attitude of some people. Or a Wednesday night service, you know, like I would go to one church I went to, they had Wednesday night, you go, you go to Sunday service, it's a small church, you go to Sunday service, about 100, 150 people there, you go to Wednesday night service, and there's 20 people there, like, oh, okay, so this is the real congregation, when you go to the Wednesday night service, these are the dedicated people. There might be those one or two that, you know, they really, you know, it's a weekday, they really do have to work, but in large part, most people can be there. And so, let me see. Okay, since I didn't plan it, I didn't, ha I don't really have an ending point, but so I hope you get, you know, get the, get the gist of what I'm saying, like, Where's your passion at? And you just listen to statistics. I was listening to it on the way home about Christians who vote in elections. And they would take, they start at the top, you know, well, I can't remember what the number was, somewhere about, I'm going to say just a rough estimate, 50 million self-describing um, evangelical Christians in the United States. And then they'd say, like less than half of that is registered to vote. That's a that's a shame. That that's the church's shame. That's pastor's shame for not getting your people involved. You are 
See, we don't live under a king that there's nothing you can do except go and beg him to do something. We live in a uh, government where you have a say in your government. So when you don't say anything, you're putting your approval on whatever comes in there. So just rough estimate of just that one statistic, half the church is perfectly fine with this demonic, evil administration that is in the office right now. You're perfectly fine with it. Your stamp of approval is on it. You don't care. And, you know, you're, you're good in your little world. So then they took that half, and it, it, went, it, it was like another half that only voted in presidential elections, and the other half skipped out on the midterms. It's like again, and then and then when they do go vote, they do, does anybody do you do you investigate what you're voting for? You know, I I find it hilarious. I'm you know I, I like watching stuff on YouTube when I got time. Um, you know, all, I, I watched this thing called um, what was it called? Like like Biden voters regret or whatever, and people talk. People go on there, I voted for Biden because he promised this and he promised that and he hasn't done anything for me or my group and broke his promise and I'm never voting for him again and whatnot and, and that's all well and good. And, I, and I'm just thinking to myself, what were you doing in the in the election season up to up to the point of voting for him? Where were you? What were you listening to? It was so painfully obvious what he was said he, he said he was going to do so he, it's like you're not absolved for putting him there and for being a part of the evil that he's doing right now because well i didn't know he was going to do that because you weren't paying attention you you, you you did what your tv told you to do is, is really what it comes down to your, your tv told you to hate trump so you hated trump your tv told you well, biden's the greatest thing ever so go vote for Biden. Well, okay, I'll go vote for Biden. Oh, wait a minute. He's not. You know, it's like you are not absolved from that. Of course, there's repentance and forgiveness. And I, I, I really hope people that put him in there do some soul searching and realize what they've done. You know, of course, there's forgiveness available. But but your vote matters to God because it is tell, because when you vote for something... You are telling the whole world that you approve of not only what that person's going to do and stand for, and obviously politicians lie. Yes, I get that. They didn't even lie. They were perfectly clear about what they were going to do and what they stood for. You voted for them anyway because your TV told you to. So, you know, you're not absolved from, from being a part of that. You're a part of this. I just watched person after person. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I won't do it anymore. I didn't know. And it's like, you knew. You knew. There, there's just no excuse. There, there, there was just no excuse for putting Biden in office. Now, of course, there, there's also the, the issue of election fraud and all that. And, you know, it was absolutely there. And I actually don't believe the American people put Biden in office. I think Biden's people put Biden in office, but there still are legitimate people who did legitimately uh, vote for him. I know about, I know some of them, and then they say the same thing. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, well, uh, never mind. I can go on for about half an hour about that. And it really wasn't. This isn't really a political message. This is a what are you passionate about? Are you pa if you're passionate for the kingdom of God and think the things of God, if the church was passionate about the kingdom of God and the things of God, this nation would be a different nation than what it is now. There would be nothing godless people could do to stand in the way of the church if the church acted like the church. If we voted according to biblical, Christ-centered, not self-centered, Christ-centered principles. If you went to work, lived your life, you know, participated in the things that 
or did not participate in the things that the world, you know, that these TV shows that are the number one, you know, the most evil, godless, vile TV shows would not be number one if Christians didn't watch it. How, how disgusting is that? These movies would not be billion dollar movies that teach the most godless, vile things if Christians did not go to watch them. These books would not be bestsellers that contain the most immoral, disgusting, revolting things in them if Christians did not buy them. It would not happen. If instead you went and supported Christ-centered media and, and forms of entertainment and things like that, that's what would be out there for the world to see. And, and by the way, that, that's what my the whole idea about my book was was just thinking about you know my wife and i our favorite types of movies and entertainment we like the fantasy sci-fi type stuff space you know medieval period fantasy stuff like that and we're looking for shows to watch and there's there's just nothing it's like wait a minute there's all these shows out here yeah and they're disgusting there's no way i couldn't i couldn't watch it without being sick to my soul i mean we tried a couple. We didn't last more than a few minutes. And I just started to get sick in my soul. Like, I have to go take a shower just from watching five minutes of this. So the whole idea behind my book was like, well, I can complain about it, or I can just do something about it and write my own. Even if nobody else reads it. I got to. Read my own story. I told my own story and got to read it. And I actually am enjoying the process. So like I told a couple of people, I, even if my even if my book sells one copy, the copy I buy, I'll enjoy it. I got to read something from my favorite type of genre, my favorite story, and it was Christ-centered. It was biblical values. It was good and moral and decent. There, there's no filth in it. So that's my pitch anyway for my book. But, um, so I hope you really got a lot out of this and just, just ask yourself, what are you passionate about? Um, and I don't know when I'll be back on again. I got a lot more writing to do, um, but I will be back. So God bless you. And I, I really do hope you find, um, your Christ centered passion. God bless.